You're in the water loop. <laughs> Waterloop is made possible in part by grants from Springpoint Partners and the Walton Family Foundation. Waterloop. Hi, this is Travis with Waterloop. Plastic pollution is a huge problem in our environment and in our water. Unfortunately, it's everywhere, and we've got to do what we can to reduce the plastic that's in our society. This stuff takes hundreds of years to break down, and it's made with fossil fuels, which just drives climate change. That's why I'm a big fan of the solid metal construction of High Sierra shower heads. There's no plastic involved. They're made with solid plated brass, stainless steel, and heavy duty aluminum. Even the seals and hoses are made from silicone rubber. So again, no plastic in High Sierra shower heads. That's unlike the competitors out there in the market, which have a lot of plastic involved. Often the metal you see is just a thin layer covering plastic. Another advantage of this solid metal construction is durability. High Sierra shower heads are simply going to last a long time. You can get 20% off using promo code LOOP20 at HighSierraShowerHeads.com. You're in the water loop. Welcome to Waterloop. This is Travis. Going to be talking about the Great Lakes for this episode, joined by David Rankin. He is Executive Director of the Great Lakes Protection Fund. David, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thrilled to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Travis. Absolutely. So uh, there's always lots going on with the Great Lakes, right? Uh, I see so many stories from around the Great Lakes, so much stuff happening. It's really an incredible area. Uh, obviously one of the greatest freshwater resources in, in the world, but lots happening with innovation and water management. So excited to talk to you about it. Um, let's start with one fun little thing I see in the news often. Uh, I've seen stuff on social media, maybe not the news, people saying, hey, to deal with that big drought in the West, in the Colorado River Basin, let's just build a pipeline from the Great Lakes and, and pump that water down there. What's your reaction when you see stuff like that? Well, first, thank you for distinguishing between social media and news. Uh, that's, <laughs> there's a, there, can, there can be, there are, isn't always, but there can be a pretty big spread in, in, in those things. And I, I've seen some of that too. I've seen articles calling for um, uh, the interstate highway system for water, for example, or, or things like that. And, and as, as you, you kind of hinted at, that's not a new idea. It's, it is, uh, something that that comes up as droughts get worse or candidly here in this region as uh as lake levels or flooding increases um the reason it hasn't happened is probably the reason it, it won't happen uh you and and your listeners know water's heavy stuff i mean it's it's eight and a half pounds per gallon and moving it over the Rockies is is a is a is a pretty big challenge. Uh, in the past, where there were proposals for for everything from coal slurry pipelines to recharging the Ogallala Aquifer, the number of power plants required simply to move the move the water around is staggering. Uh, the engineering feat that that uh, would be required is is staggering. Uh, but the biggest barrier, and those are substantial, the biggest barrier is, is, is a legal barrier. Uh, the states in the Great Lakes have built not just an interstate compact, but a series of international agreements with Canada to keep this water in place. It's 20% of the world's fresh surface water. It's the foundation of our economy. And it is something that, as long as we are careful stewards of it, uh, uh, should remain here. And the, the the likelihood that we will see a, a you know a massive diversion is 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 pretty small, given the strength of the legal protections uh, that we have here, not just domestically but but internationally. So uh, you know, come. You know, two weeks from now, when there's an official shortage declared in in uh, California, Arizona, and and other places dependent on on Lake Mead, uh, that that noise will ratchet up again, and um, uh, it's something that that you know that, that candidly we're prepared for here, and we're willing to be of assistance, but assistance in 
how to manage water, not in how to supply water. Mm. Yeah, great points. Uh, key key point you made is that this is this is not just the Great Lakes are not just U.S. water bodies, right? These are international water bodies, shared boundary with Canada. Um, one other little thing I want to ask about before we dive into some of our, our questions yeah. is is the idea of the high water levels, um, yes. and and how that comes about and what that does to the Great Lakes communities. Well, uh, you know the the, the lake shores are 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 dynamic. Uh, water levels go up, water levels come down. And uh, of late, those changes have been happening faster than, uh, faster than they have before. So uh, when levels are high, it can be a problem. I mean, erosion on the shores, inundation of, of uh, lakeside property are things that our region has 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 struggled with. Uh, right now, the lake levels are are on a downward tra trajectory, uh, and those problems are abating a bit. But it's a it's a it's a it's a natural consequence of of you know being around again twenty percent of the world's fresh surface water. It's uh, it's it's a lot of water, and it has uh, uh, a lot of a lot of energy and a lot of uh, uh, um, kind of inertia behind it. When when levels go up, they go up. Things move around. When I go down, they go down, and uh, we respond to that as well. Sure. <clears throat> well, I have most of my <clears throat> personal experience all the way at the end of the system, where you know the Great Lake or the Great Lake Center, St. Lawrence River. Um, you know, kind of grew up going to the Thousand Islands, right there where Lake Ontario goes into the St. Lawrence, and. Even the high water levels of the past few years, I've you know have damaged boathouses and all kinds of property along along the lakes. But awesome. Well, we'll I'm sure we'll other news topics will come along come up as we chat here. But um, Great Lakes Protection Fund, what is it? Well, the, the fund is the world's first impact investor, where the beneficiary is an ecosystem. Uh, we were created 32 years ago. Uh, to produce a continuous stream of innovation to make us better and better and better as a region at uh, the shared stewardship of, of this vast resource. So it, the fund is an interesting critter. We're a, we're a private not-for-profit corporation literally owned by uh, seven governors. The governors elect a board, the board hires me, and uh, we have taken... Eighty-one million dollars of, of public capital invested that in the in the, in the uh, capital markets, turned it into about two hundred and fifty million dollars of income that we've used to. Uh, long story short, drive a whole set of of new ways of of, of doing things here, uh, ranging from technologies that uh, can help us keep invasive species out of the system to uh, restoration strategies that take advantage of the physical properties of the system to drive uh, both chemical and biological change, um, standing up new governance schemes like the uh, Great Lakes Compact and international agreements I mentioned on water diversions. Uh, we've done a whole host of things with that. And uh, it's, it's, it's really a, both a pleasure and an honor to be part of such a unique organization. There is literally nothing like it anywhere else on the globe. You mentioned that you're basically owned by seven governors. <laughs> That's incredibly unique for sure. Uh, se seven different bosses that change all the time and have different affiliations and so forth. Right. Um, how do they, as the bosses, give you guys marching orders? Just to kind of use that type of terminology, how how does that work? Sure. Sure. That's a that's a, that's a great question. So I, I've had the privilege of working for forty two governors. Every every set of seven. Uh, has the has the ability to use the fund as a as a legacy of their work and a gift to the next governors. So to their credit, the governors have a very long time horizon in mind with the protection fund. They set us up with a set of, of pretty tailored marching orders, to use your term, that are baked into our articles of incorporation that that set some pretty firm guidelines about what we can and what we cannot do. Uh, the governors themselves have adopted um, uh, uh, very durable 
long-term goals for the region, and we operate within those within those goals. My job and the job of the board that they elect um, to to you know be my bosses and, and run the corporation is to look for the look for the opportunities with within those within those shared priorities where we can make not just a little bit of difference but a big transformational difference and um, uh, uh, that's how that works so so we have the the, the charge to talk to experts inside and outside of government in the private sector in, in the academy and in other places to, sh- to shape strategies and, and, and projects that, that meet the shared stewardship responsibilities of the governors and help them, help them do that stuff more efficiently. Mm-hmm. So it's, a, uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting mix of, of long-term gubernatorial direction coupled with, um, basically continuous input from from experts uh uh so that so that we're we're delivering what 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 they've asked for Hmm. and i'd like to dive into this approach of yours because you're not just funding the typical restoration and protection projects you have you have a a very unique approach that i think's uh really inspiring and really important i'd love for you to kind of to explain that a little bit Sure. So, so if, if one looks at the the, the 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 let's just call it the funding picture in in our in our region, uh, we have um, uh, we at the protection fund have the ability to do uh, four to six million dollars of mission work in any given year. Uh, when you look at what philanthropy does in this region, and we're very active with sixty. 60, 65 Great Lakes oriented uh, philanthropic institutions, uh, foundations and special purpose funds. Uh, they, they, can, they can do maybe 40 to $60 million in any, in any given year. Uh, when you look at the, the, um, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, a, a shared initiative by 16 federal agencies that have coordinated uh, their really their protection and restoration work on, on the Great Lakes, that's 375 to 400 million a year. When you look at the rest of the federal spend in the region, there's another um, billion dollars or so through uh, ag programs and kind of base EPA programs and fish and wildlife programs and, 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 and so on and so forth. Then you step, to, you step out and you say, okay, well, let's look at what, what regional governments spend. Let's look at what the the states and counties and, and, and local governments spend and, and the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative is estimated that that is a, around $15 billion a year. Hmm. So I go through, I go through all, of, all of those numbers to, to, so that I can say, one, what we're not, and second, what we are. What we're not is we're not the, the last $4 million into a, into a $16 billion spending stream. We're not looking to 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 buy change at retail or to, you know, add, add, add our add our little bit of money to the to to the massive spend that's that's already ongoing in the region. Rather, the challenge that that the challenge and the opportunity that that we have at the fund is to take that four to six million dollars a year of, of mission spend and make the other sixteen billion dollars smarter and more effective. So, so our our charge and the, the the reason the governor stood us up to provide this continuous stream of innovation is to grow the effectiveness of the spending in the region, uh, independent of whether of whether the whether the total spend grows. Uh, those are kind of political choices outside of our outside of our domain, but we want to be sure that 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 every unit of effort. Put into put into Great Lakes work or our activities related to the Great Lakes have the best possible restoration outcomes that that they can. So our portfolio of programming is really designed to to um, be a force multiplier with 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 the other spending. Mm. Gotcha, absolutely. And so you are really look for these like emerging areas, right? You use the word innovation, which I think is key. And these, these emerging areas, these things that might be, you know, game changers in some, some sense. Is that right? 
We do. I mean, I, so so um, uh, I've had the, the the privilege of working in the, the public and private sectors in my career, and have worked in have worked in programs that deliver phenomenal results, but deliver results where either the, the, the either we're, we're we're attempting to uh, cost share in programs and you know have a two to one match or a uh, 75, 25 match things, things like that, or, or where we, we, um, uh, line up programming to, to, toward a, a, a shared North star and, and have everybody, you know, have everybody pulling on the same one, the same direction and, 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 and that kind of thing. The, the model is really different here at the fund. I mean, I, where, where, where you look at those relationships as, as things that, that can double or triple, uh, the effectiveness of the effectiveness of those programmings, we're looking for ten to the x order of magnitude style returns. Um, so when we when we you know did a roughly three million dollars set of grant making over over a five year horizon, trying to stand up some technologies that work on vessels to take invasive to keep invasive species out of them. Uh, uh, you know that three million investment has turned into a, a, an industry whose annual revenue is seventeen to nineteen billion dollars, depending on the the, the the market surveys you want to believe. Or when we when we looked at um, uh, um, uh, work in sustainable forestry, we tried to put a market in place that created um, uh, the premiums for sustainably managed timber in the marketplace and drove, you know, the, the footprint of that from the first 800 acres we worked on to what's over 44 million acres today. Hmm. So we're looking for, you know, to your point, we're, we're, we're looking for big changes, things, things that you measure in the numbers of orders of magnitude of change you drive, not the, you know, n- not the two to one, three to one match or, other things that are that are, that are clearly worth doing, but that that uh, don't necessarily match 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 our charge. Mm. Well, there's a real uh, trick or magic or hard work <laughs> that goes into finding those things, right? How do you yeah. how do you go about identifying these kind of opportunities that are going to offer such an order of magnitude or that are really yeah. emerging ways to tackle some of the challenges? It's that's that's a uh, really interesting. Well, I mean, it's 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 that's kind of our stock stock and trade, right? I mean, it's sort it sort of is what we do, but we have the benefit of looking at the track records of other people that have done this really well. So, so one of the one of the uh, uh, inspiration one of my inspirations is the the, the uh, management professor Peter Drucker. Hmm. When when Peter was alive, he had he identified. Uh, a handful of a handful of characteristics of, of those traits of changes in and the one that resonates most with me and that and that comes up candidly most often in in our work is look for look for the look for those things that everyone believes to be true that simply are not so let me give you an example um, when when we began having conversations with uh, uh, folks around invasive species and you know why we were seeing one discovered every six weeks in the region and what we were going to do about it, there was a there was a genuine genuine sense of despair that it was a big unsolvable problem that came from too many too many places and would be would be really impossible to control and that our circumstances were so unique since we were a freshwater ecosystem and da 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 anyway there was this sense that that um, uh, uh, there was this general shared sense that this problem was too hard to tackle and we began to say well what if we assume that it is tackleable let's go look for how one might do that and we reached out to a network of very smart people and began to build a story based on facts and evidence and data that the scale of the problem in our system was actually completely manageable hmm. if you were to compare it to something like 
managing point sources uh, uh, through the NPDES permitting program. I mean, it, it, where we have what 330 major municipalities in the in, in the region and a similar number of industries. The number of vessels that were that were driving the the ballast mediated portion of that problem was was smaller than that, and it was much smaller, smaller than that by a factor of five. Uh, so so the number of sources weren't big. Uh, the technology that that could be applied, you know, is tricky. Ships are ships are complex environments. They're they're uh, very, 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 the economics of that industry is very, very sensitive to delays and costs and things like that. But um, on the treatment technology side, there were people working with similar flow rates and similar uh, similar um, sensitivities to, to some of the engineering dimensions that had already shown that, that you could take 90 or 95 or 99 percent of the, 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 the critters out of, a, out of an intake stream. So we began to, to line those pieces up and decided, okay, well, we can, we can, we can uh, begin to build some teams to make, a, to make a real difference here. So anyway, that's a, that's a long illustration of, 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 one, of, the, one, of the, one of the traits of, of, of this kind of innovation is to um, uh, be a little skeptical of received wisdom that is uh, that's keeping people in the status quo, and uh, you know there there are two or three other classes of those things, but I, I I won't bore you and your listeners with something they can read in Drucker's material. Oh, very very interesting. Um, have to have a whole different mindset, whole different way of thinking, and then so. I'd love to hear just kind of the ultimate, I guess, success with the ballast water piece, because that's the invasive species in the Great Lakes is something that people have heard about um, very commonly in the news right. and, and all that. So, you know, what's been the, the success there? Well, so when when we, again, when we started down this road, there were uh, 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 new invasive species being discovered in this system, as I said, about every six weeks. I mean, uh, uh uh, Tony Ricciardi, then at McGill, was did a great piece in 2006 where he really decomposed the rates and the, the, the nature of introductions and things like that. And, and uh, that was the that was the system that we were working in when we started. And because of some of the things I, I, I've shared, we you know put a challenge out to the smart people we were working with saying, you know, look, there's a million dollars on the table. If you guys can get a, a system installed on a working vessel um, and uh, uh, testing its efficacy in a year, you know, and we'll, we'll fund it, we'll finance it and off we go. And, you know, to, to their credit, the, the Lake Curies Association, the Northeast Midwest Institute, University of Michigan School of Naval Architecture, um, a small engineering firm in Cleveland called Hyde Engineering, all put their put their heads together and, and, and got it done. And lo and behold, it was a it was a game changer in the space because the the um, uh, that installation on uh, Algoma uh, Central Marines Algo North uh, carrier uh, had a, a ninety to ninety five percent efficacy against not just critters but the particle sizes that 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 would be. Uh, that, what you'd expect of invasives, and that just simply led to a led to a cascade of uh, a cascade of activity uh, uh, around the globe. I mean, it, it, it led to what became the uh, International Maritime Organization's Convention on Ballast Water. It led to um, uh, some changes in, in how invasive species risk is managed in the industry, with reinsurers, you know, putting the onus on the on the on the on the carriers, the folks that own the vessels, uh, to solve the problem, um, and uh, it opened it opened an entire set of innovations around. Okay, what you know, as these technologies are developing and the industry is spinning up, what else can we do? And that led to folks looking at uh, ballast water exchange and and um, you know using using salt water to to basically clean out ballast tanks and during the voyages so none of the gunk in the bottom would uh, be discharged into um, into our waters here 
net net, you run the clock ahead a bunch of years, and it's a bunch of years. You look at you look at what happened from basically 2006 to to today. That rate of invasive species discovery, which was one every six weeks, has gone to about one every six years. Wow! And uh, you know, you, if you do the math in your head, that's uh, that's way above a 90 percent reduction in the in the in the in the pressure in the system. And you know we were we were we we were happy to play to play a part in that, but you know the the hard work was done by those folks that I that I mentioned uh, in terms of jump starting the industry. Um, uh, Hyde Marine uh, was acquired by by you know one of the Fortune 100s, and and they they're they're a world leader in building that technology now. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a it's it's a you know when. When things when things go right, they can go they can go really right, and that yeah. that's an example of it. I think another area uh, that you you mentioned was about forest protection and what's yeah. been achieved there. Um, I really in, enjoy that story. Love to, to love to hear it. Well, I, when uh, uh, we looked at the forest landscape, the fund had done a couple of projects in forestry. Um, uh, in my early years here and, and starting before I arrived and, uh, uh, you know, we identified some, some issues that were, um, presenting problems for the lakes if they weren't managed quite correctly, stream crossings and stream bank erosion and, you know, harvest cycles and harvest times and, and land cover and, and all of the things you might expect from, from, from a, a silver culture operation and you know we, we had begun to to identify management practices and things things that might work but what was what was missing in that was a pull that is the uh, an incentive to uh, get the landowners to 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 use to use those practices because they simply saw them as cost centers and there wasn't a lot of coherence in, in, around you know management planning and things like that that isn't a criticism. It's just the it's just the just the way business was done. We also noticed in the industry that that many of the industrial owners, the you know the the warehousers and the paper companies, were beginning to divest, and there was a, a big increase in privately owned non industrial forest land, and we saw that transition as as perhaps an opportunity. So we with 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 other with other funding partners. And I, I, you know, I have to give Mike Northrup at Rockefeller Brothers a, a lot of credit, and Mike Jenkins then at MacArthur, a lot of credit. Andrew McElwain at the Heinz Endowments, a lot of credit for getting a number of us in a room and saying, "Okay, what's the nature of the opportunity here, and how might we, how might we, how might we, we elevate the the game of of sustainable forestry? How do we, how do we create the the, the a genuine marketplace, the right incentives, and enough certainty?" Around the labeling, so that so that it can be it can be done um, in a way that throws off benefits in addition to um, uh, timber and fiber. So we started working uh, uh, in 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 Minnesota to uh, learn from and 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 help standardize the the third party certification scheme of the then brand new Forest Stewardship Council um, and our. Our, our our aim was to be sure that water was centered in 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 those standards, and that uh, there would be benefits for the for the, the lake states in um, uh, getting forestry right means getting water right. So so um, so we began to stand that up. We started working with um, uh, a group of national experts to build out not only the standards, but to begin to engage folks in the supply chain and in the in the value chain to. Um, uh, be sure there was a place for product. If the if the supply was created, that there would be a demand for it. That demand would either carry a, a sufficient brand differentiation to allow access to markets that hadn't been available before, and ideally, and this happened, a, a premium in price so that people had an incentive to undertake the uh, the, the management planning and practice and and so on and so forth. And then we began working with. Uh, with landowners, uh, the state of New York was one of the first big landowners out of the box to certify all 750,000 of their of their state forest lands. Uh, Pennsylvania, with support from the Heinz Endowments, did the same thing, 
and that primed the pump so that that others entities both public and private began to um, upgrade their management began to pay more attention to water and began to see a, a, a premium in the a premium in the marketplace right. so that's that that market pull is what has drawn the um, um, drawn the uh, the footprint of sustainable forestry in our region from 800 acres in Cook County, Minnesota to, to 44 million acres, not just FSC, that is Forest Stewardship Council certified, but also with the Sustainable Forestry in- Initiative, the uh, American Forests and Paper Association third party certified standards that basically are equivalent to FSC standards. So it was it was a win, win, win. We have a we have a. Uh, a market for those for those products. Uh, we have landowners that are that are um, uh, doing high quality land and water management and, and getting getting paid for the paid for their work. Mm. Incredible success story, it really, really is. Um, third thing I wanted to ask you about yeah. that falls under your notable accomplishments category. That okay. I, want, I want to chat with people is this is natural flows. Um, yeah. What does that mean? And what has happened in that area? <laughs> the fact that you have to ask me what natural flows mean may, may, may mean it's less of a success than, than we <laughs> uh, in in the in the in the mid nineties, nineteen ninety five. Uh, there was a very important uh, scientific paper uh, written by uh, a group of folks I have a tremendous amount of, of respect for. Uh, Brian Richter from Nature Conservancy, Dave Allen mm. from University of Michigan, uh, Leroy Poff from uh, uh, Colorado. And, and there were um, some principles they articulated there that, 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 gripped, that gripped us at the fund. What they identified was um, uh, a set of relationships between the hydrology of, of, of rivers and streams and, and the ecology and biology that, that emerges from that hydrology. They were able to articulate in, a, in, in this peer-reviewed paper what they described as a master variable for, for, um, for aquatic health. And that is you know, five facets of how water moves. Um, that is how fast it moves, how fast the movement changes, that is the rate of mm-hmm. the rate of change of that, the frequency of the frequency of flow events, um, um, and and its its pattern over the year. <clears throat> and a couple of and a couple of other features that were articulated so well, they 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 had the appearance to us at the fund of, oh, wait, these are management levers. <laughs> These are these are these these are these are these are knobs and dials that that we can turn by activities in stream or on the land that that um, uh, can really help drive drive ecological restoration. And we launched a, a, a series of you know a, a, we launched a um, portfolio of projects that that really built out the the practical how you take that 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 concept and and turn it into turn it into restoration on the land and we worked with again a, a, a group of a, a group of experts to to build out this portfolio that addressed everything from hydroelectric dam reoperation and new licensing requirements and things like that to dam removal to um uh design of agricultural drainage ditches to um, uh, uh, projects that that looked at better ways to think about the management of, of, uh, of shallow aquifer wells and ag irrigation and and, and, and things like that we, we we did this not because not only because the uh, the restoration opportunity was was so so vast. Nobody had nobody had been working in this space um, uh, uh, across the landscape the size of ours yet. I mean, Brian had done work in, at TNC, and and some of the other some of the other folks had been had been very active in in, in smaller projects. But we wanted to take this to a scale that, that that mattered. We also wanted to to begin to capture some of the the, the learning and turn those 
knobs and levers into lessons about how to do water governance better. And that work became uh, foundational for uh, uh, sort of the sort of a set of a set of programming that we did around how do you practically implement a joint water resources management compact that not only prevents diversions out of the Great Lakes, but that ensures that any major decision we make about big water movements within the basin are designed to make it healthier and healthier and healthier over time. So uh, that's a, that's a lot. That's a lot of a lot of words. Uh, uh, let me see if I can uh, give you a thumbnail about some of some of the some of the things that actually that actually changed as a result. Sure. Um, in 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 the northern part of our basin, um, uh, uh, there are perhaps two rivers that don't have a dam at the first rapids. Most of those were, were for logging. All of them now are virtually all of them now are hydropower facilities. Um, our grantees helped shift the shift those shift those facilities from peak operations, that is driving air conditioners in the Twin Cities, Milwaukee, and Detroit in the summertime, uh, to run of the river operations, and in so doing, restored over 1,500 miles of, of biological health to, to basin streams. It's remarkable. Uh, all done with with zero impact on the bottom line for the for the utility companies. And are, are now part of their 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 50 year operating operating license requirements. Uh, spectacular spectacular work. We took out a a, a, a dozen uh, uh, failing dams in the region, not with a view of doing site by site restoration, but with a, a view of creating a a dam removal playbook for uh, folks to use when dams began to, you know, fail safety inspections or in some other way, in some other ways needed removed. Uh, and, you know, we created a whole set of, a whole set of new uh, transactional and contracting requirements about how, how to do hyd hydroecological restoration in rivers um, so that you, so that one could not only know what you were doing, but you could document it and you transact on it. You could create a uh, a land trust style uh, entity or a contractual restoration relationship, and have the the ecological outcomes kind of foregrounded as as key factors in 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 those transactions. Hmm. It's pretty cool work. Right. Yeah, incredible, incredible stuff. Well, it's crystal ball time. Uh, okay. you know, looking, looking forward here, you know, since you're always looking at these emerging areas, considering what the big challenges are, where are the opportunities? Um, yeah. What's, what's out there right now, um, when it comes to the great lakes? It's a great, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. And, and, and I'm going to need to answer it a, a couple of different ways. Uh, when, when, yeah, how, how do I want to say it? Um, like any ecosystem of this size or importance, it is not hard to find problems. <laughs> there are inventories of issues and inventories of beneficial use impairments and uh, you know, uh, emerging pollutants and you know, wildlife problems. There's a whole host of the, a whole host of those problems. And, and um, you know, honestly, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of our time talking about those because I, I, I think they're, I think they're, I think they're pretty pretty well known. Yeah. I think the answers or the solutions are in some of the dynamics around those problems. Let me give you a couple a couple examples to make that at least a little bit less abstract. <laughs> uh, uh, I think when we, when 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 we have internal discussions about about lake levels and lake level change and, and things like that, it's um, uh, easy to get stuck in the the, the first order relationships. How many? How many? You know, how much bluff erosion is there? How many homes are inundated? Uh, where are the landfills adjacent to the shore? Um, you know, and, and things like that that are that are that are really that are really important. But but boy, is there a lot of energy in this region chasing that? I think our interest is probably in the in the in the intersection of of the increase in speed of of, of lake level change. The ability to get high highs very quickly and to go from high highs to low lows very quickly. 
that is going to force us to think differently about the assets we want to protect. And those assets are probably going to have a, a process dimension to them rather than an address dimension to them. So, so a place that, that, that we're going to explore intervening, and I can't say that we've, we've found it yet, is about how to, how to address the process changes that are, that are at work in the, not only in the coastal environment, but in repairing environments as well. How do you how do you how do you play in the space of, of managing long, longshore transport of sand, or how do you play in the space of, of of needing benches and irrigation dishes, or not irrigation dishes, but in drainage ditches, so that um, the capacity for big events is there, and the biological integrity is is preserved in spite of those big events. So everything just doesn't simply wash either down the stream or worse into 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 operating ag fields. So the, the those dynamics are one piece. Another dynamic that that I, I think we're paying attention to, and it's a it, it is at present uh, what I call a weak signal, but it's it's really paying attention to uh, what might happen with demographics from 2030 to 2050. Uh, if there is, uh, uh, you know, increasing um, bright day flooding in, in our coastal cities, increasing inundation in in uh, on the on the seaboards, what does that mean for uh, uh, people moving not just not just not just a few miles inland, but moving to a place that is um, uh, perhaps more secure from that particular. Uh, Set of set of changes than than uh, some of our coastal states might be. So we're looking we're looking at demographic shifts, and that makes us look at what do we what do we what do we need to do to grow the to grow the 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 economy here in a way that promotes health in our lake to accommodate some new folks. How do we how do we how do we how do we put out a, a a welcome mat that helps us that helps us grow in a sustainable way, and um, again, I don't have I don't have answers to that, but that's a the the demographic dynamic is another thing we're 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 paying attention to. Um, third, and this is this is a, a sweet spot across a number of a number of the episodes that, that you've covered, and yeah. and uh, you know we're we're looking for clues among the smart people you're talking to as well. <laughs> What, what's the what's the dynamic in the so-called water utility space? And the reason I say so-called is that uh, our, our, our water utilities are generally, not always, but generally rifle shot responses to 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 statute. Uh, they're purpose built entities to um, uh, uh, drive compliance with requirements and. We're wondering if there isn't something more more dynamic and more expansive they can do, you know, following the lead of of, of you know East Bay Mud, Seattle, Milwaukee, Buffalo, Hampton Roads, you, 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 you know that 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 leadership set. What can we what can we learn and how can how can they be a a an anchor institution in 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 our in our Great Lakes communities? Yeah. Well, no shortage of accomplishments in your rearview mirror, no shortage of challenges and emerging opportunities out your windshield. Um, always tons happening in the Great Lakes. So I'm really glad we got to catch up and have this conversation. Look forward to following along to, uh, to what's next up there. Thanks, Travis. This is great. Waterloop. Thanks, everyone, for listening to today's episode. A special thanks to Waterloop supporters, Springpoint Partners, and the Walton Family Foundation. The Waterloop Podcast is sponsored by High Sierra Showerheads, the smart, stylish way to save energy, water, and money while enjoying a powerful shower. Use promo code LOOP20 for 20% off at highsierrashowerheads.com. If you like Waterloop, please subscribe to the YouTube channel or your favorite podcast platform. Follow us on social media and visit waterloop.org to sign up for updates. Waterloop, Waterloop.